It is 10 o'clock. Okay. So if you'd like a seat, there's a couple chairs left uh, around. Uh, really great to see everybody here this morning on a rainy morning. But as I was driving in and walking in from the parking lot, I thought to myself, how appropriate for the subject. Falling <laughs> water. Yeah. Sherry, you outdo everybody. You even do the outside. Yeah. I train hard. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you very much. And so without further ado, it's so nice to see so many people turn out to uh, hear another fabulous presentation. And we'll get into that soon. So I'll open with prayer and then turn it over to our speakers. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the oppor opportunity to join in fellowship with others and to hear things that we may not know and refresh our memory if we've been acquainted before. Just ask that you be with all those in our presence and in the congregation that are in need of your comfort and healing touch. Be with our elected officials, help them to make wise and compromising decisions with each other. Just bless this church as we go through our, our year and be with us this day. Amen. Dave? Thanks, Ted. Um, we have a uh, great group of speakers coming up. If anyone is new, and there's a few, I will put these in the back. And you can pick one up before you leave. It'll be laying on the table back there. Uh, we go through May 16th, okay, uh, in which we finish with a Radley Run uh, luncheon at, at the Radley Run Country Club. And I'm working on a tour of their new golf facilities, which they are putting up right now. So anyway, that's kind of a teaser. Uh, but there are some great talks. We've all... We uh, will finish, as I said, May 16th, and we will start back up in September uh, with Dr. Leah, uh, Pastor Leah Karakovic, and she'll both do the last one on May 16th, and she'll do the starting one in September. She'll give us her vision for the next year in September and what she thinks of us. <laughs> in May. It may take more than an hour. Yeah, you may want to have a drink before you know. <laughs> But anyway, this is a great talk. Uh, I've been educated every which way. Initially, I called it flowing water, <laughs> and then flowing waters, and then falling waters, and it's falling water. So uh, that's what it, the official name is. And we're so happy that Sherry and Ray, who started coming in September, uh, she volunteered to talk to us and already has volunteered for another presentation. So uh, it's really great. So Sherry, uh, well, without further ado. Okay, stay close till I okay. <laughs> made okay. a couple of slide transitions. Okay, so uh, just. Uh, you're sir. Yep. Okay, all right. Okay, so thank you all for coming. And thank you, thank you, Dave, so much for your help. And thanks for Ted. Thanks to Ted. It's a great group. A little closer. A little closer. A little closer. Yeah, Okay, all right. Am I way too loud? No, no, no. Okay, all right. So I brought my Molly Water hat, but I'm not going to wear it. But I get doing it. And somewhere I have a falling water walking stick. I have falling water, or at least Frank Lloyd Wright earrings and necklace. I tried to go all in. And I'm pretty sure I bought this sweater a long time ago because it reminded me of like Taliesin West and the colors of the, of the West. Yeah. But um, Ray and I, um, sorry, I'm going to stop, go back. Um, my original interest in Frank Lloyd Wright architecture began really young as a child. Um, there were, he had drawn plans for a skyscraper in New York City, which never got built, and that was in the 20s, so pretty early in his career. And in the 50s, it was built in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, which was a couple hours from where I lived. It was very famous at the time. I'm not an engineer or an architect. I just knew that there was a lot of question about 
the way he was building it and the support system and some controversy, but also he was a very famous person building a building in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. And I just have that little bit of a memory from being six or eight years old. Um, so from that, Ray and I moved to uh, Kansas City and in Kansas City, there were a few properties. There's a church there that's available for visits. One of my friends, her son and his wife had a very small wedding ceremony there. There are a couple of private homes and I was looking, one of the private homes sold within the last couple of years. And of course they usually need lots and lots of work, but it sold for just over a million dollars, which seems like a bargain for a Frank Lloyd Wright home. So then when we moved to Pittsburgh, Ray and I bought an arts and crafts style house. And I already was interested in that whole design period and that style of home and furniture. And I became more interested in Frank Lloyd Wright. Falling Water was an hour and a half away from us, which is kind of what the map is. Dave, Dave wanted to show you how far I drove when I volunteered. Um, when our son went to college in 2008, around that time, I heard that I could be a volunteer at Falling Water. That sounded wonderful. I didn't know what I'd be doing, but I went for the orientation. And I went once a month during the months that they are open, uh, like March through December, I think I basically went March through August or September for probably six or seven years. And it was a three hour round trip. You had to commit to being there for five hours and you got a free lunch and a discount at the gift shop, which is pretty, pretty important. It was a great, all these places have great gift shops. Um, and it was a beautiful drive. I, we have a convertible. Sometimes I would take a convertible and just enjoy the curves and the trees and the beauty of the, the area. But my, I was not a docent. Um, people, all the staff there are paid staff members and it's a pretty poor area. So those are really pretty good jobs for those people to have. So they really hire people who live very close. But the people like me, we were called Ask, Ask Me Guides, A-M-G. And um, I'm sorry, would you grab a tissue for me out of my purse? I'm sorry. <coughs> um, and basically we just, we could kind of roam the property, but what they really asked us to do was, um, sorry, wrong way. My, my work is done. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well. My apologies. <clears throat> so looking at this, at this slide, um, towards like where the stream comes down in the lower left corner, there's an overlook there that looks at the house and looks at the waterfalls. And basically we just stood there and we took people's pictures. We reminded them to be careful on the steps and answered questions. And I don't remember getting a lot of questions because most people had the brochure and the, the things they would ask were on there. But some of the questions would be, um, where were the Kaufmans buried? Um, and we don't know. It's like a darkly, deeply kept secret. Um, how much would it cost to build it today? And who could, who could even imagine trying to build it today? Just those kind of basic questions. But it is, it is a beautiful facility and I loved just the peacefulness of being there. So when you come to the house, I'm gonna go back for a second. Um, in the lower right corner is the bridge that goes over the stream. And then you, you go where it says number two, you walk kind of around the back of the house and the entrance. So this is what you pass going into the house and you see those stairs. And when we get into the in-house pictures, there is um, a glass ceiling basically, or glass floor, whichever way you're looking at it, above those steps, but it slides back and they could just walk down and have their own little area to wade in the water. Very, very cold water. Um, so my, my in-house slides might kind of jump around a little bit, so bear with me, but Frank Lloyd Wright was known for um, a, a style called compress and release. Back up one and then come back again. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll fill it out. There. Okay. Sorry. <clears throat> compress and release. He was a very short man, so he liked small spaces and low ceilings. So you would come into a narrow passageway, which there will be a picture. And then it opens up into this huge great room, which is basically the entire first floor. All of the furniture is built in. 
he did that. I just read this this week. I've learned a lot this week, and I've also had a lot of contradictory information, but, but I know this to be true. He built in the furniture because he didn't want people to change it. He yeah. was a very, very arrogant man, but he was also extremely talented. And honestly, if he wants to design your furniture and build it, <coughs> let him do it. But to the left, those double doors are the doors that go out um, to the where you could get to the stream. And we'll come back to it. Yeah, back and forth, Thank I guess. You. Gosh. All right. Sorry, I'll, I'll try to remember to look over there. So I, they have a lot of artwork and I think this might be the only thing I have a picture of, uh, but I love this painting. And when when Wyatt was little, our son, Beauty and the Beast was you know, very, very popular. And that that picture reminds me of Gaston. You know, it just, and it's it was way before that, but every time I see it, I just think Gaston. So the, the dining room table, um, is basically built in again that that you I think there's a way that it slides somewhere if you needed that extra space but again he wanted to design everything and the chairs are an exception he wanted his barrel chairs which are fabulous chairs but Lillian Kaufman had uh, a great eye for design and she had her own taste and she insisted on these antique chairs that, that were centuries old that she found, I believe in Italy. And they're three-legged chairs, which was actually a better style for this, for this rock floor. So this is the fireplace, which is the centerpiece of this one big room. And I'm gonna flip to, it did okay. Okay, so see where the cauldron is? Yeah. And then, so like I just think that is the most impressive feature, one of the most impressive features in a very impressive house. And that, of course, is Frank Lloyd Wright's signature Cherokee red color, which comes in several shades of red. But initially, he wanted all the trim to be gold, like gilt. And I guess they worked one day painting some things with gold. And he, I think he had workmen walk off the job. And that would just be him. It probably wouldn't have held up. I don't think he cared if his properties held up. I think he, it was more for looks, but it's that kettle is just fabulous. And I think when they do have a, a private event, they do sometimes use it and put hot cider in there. I, that would be wonderful. So here's the sliding ceiling floor where they can walk down to the water. Are you okay? Can I, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so this is the kitchen, and I'm not looking at my notes, so I hope I don't miss anything, but uh, the kitchen is all original. The cabinets, I'm sure, were very state-of-the-art at the time. They are very yellow, um, and my friend and I, a couple of these pictures are my pictures, because my friend and I did the in-depth tour, which at the time, <laughs> 10 or 12 years ago, was, I think, $75, and it was uh, probably an hour and a half tour, but on the in-depth tour, you see things that, like, you can take pictures inside, you get to see the kitchen. It was always such a big deal when people were on tours. If they, you, you could peek through the door of the kitchen, but to actually go in the kitchen, that was one of the highlights of our in-depth tour. And I think we got to go to the basement, which I'm pretty sure was a boiler room. But we, if, if you really are into it, the in-depth tours are usually quite worth the price. There, and that might be a duplicate. Um, okay, so in the corner rooms, the corners of the bedrooms and the office, there are these windows that, like, that's a window. There's nothing. So you see where they, you can see where they're open. And then in, at the very bottom, you can see one that's closed. So the, the glass, the, there's no frame, there's just, Really, that was he designed those for this house, and that's one of the really unusual features of the house. And of course, that overlooks the stream. Mill Run, Ray, is it Mill Run? Yeah, Mill Run. Um, just one of the views uh, their Bodhisattva <laughs> sculpture on their balcony. The upper balcony is um, the balcony off of Mrs. Kaufman's bedroom. They had separate bedrooms. And their son, who was an adult by the time they built it, 
I believe, um, had his own very small bedroom. I don't think he lived there, but here is this compress and release where you come in from the entryway downstairs and you come up this very tight hallway. At least there was headspace there, but still very close quarters. This is the covered walkway that goes up to the guest house. And looking at it when you're there, the guides usually talk about like the construction of that and the support system. And it is very fascinating to see, again, I'm not an engineer or an architect, but I can appreciate that that is a lot of, uh, a lot of effort, a lot of interesting detail. This, uh, this is the, the room they take you to at the end, like, you know, most places you have to exit through the guest, through the gift shop. This one you exit through the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy presentation where they want you to join. And it's certainly a good organization. And they usually show a little bit of a slide show. But this, in the guest house, um, it, there's one bedroom, no kitchen. Um, there's a pool for the, you know, for the property. And now they use some of the space as offices. Not, wouldn't be a bad place to have an office. And the carport. Frank Lloyd Wright was famous for not designing garages and he didn't put a lot of storage in the carports because he didn't want you to have excess things. A Frank Lloyd Wright house is not just a place you live, it's a lifestyle. So he didn't offer a lot of storage. Um, and this, these have been enclosed now. And I guess a couple of them are open, but that is where the visitor center is. Not visitor center, but the place where you get your lecture. Um, and this is actually the dark areas where you come into the house. So that little water thing would be on your right. And I think we were told that that might be where they wash the dog's paws. But just kind of a little miniature fountain. Just an exterior view. And you can see those windows there are closed. And that's one of the balconies. There's a barrel chair that's in the guest house. That is Mrs. Kaufman's bedroom with, of course, the Tiffany lamp. And again, as I said, they collected a lot of art. They were, I think, quite the patrons of the arts. So the sculpture is um, something quite old. And that is my friend, Marilyn. And I'll call her later and tell her she was part of the presentation. I uh, just threw that in, but you, can, you do get a better feel for the furnishings, those little seats that can be moved around with the yellow cushions and a different view of the kitchen. Harvest, almost harvest gold. And so I love this story. Um, this was about 15 years ago when Brad and Angelina were still together. And Brad Pitt is a huge fan of architecture and Frank Lloyd Wright. So Angelina arranged for them to have a private tour and they, the Falling Waters closed on Wednesdays. And I wanted to make a note to tell people, if you're going to any of these places, make sure you check the dates. People assume that places are closed on Mondays, but you know, several of these are closed on Wednesdays. Because I think people come to the area for a long weekend, and then if they're planning to do something Monday, there's nothing to do. But anyway, they actually stayed in the guest house. And I, as far as I know, they're the only people that have been allowed to stay there, at least as far as public knowledge. And we're just quite certain that Angelina made a very substantial contribution to Falling Water. Because it wasn't, it wasn't like they did it for publicity. This eventually ended up being in People Magazine. Look how young they look. So, oh, I have a couple other things. So among the artwork that they have, they have Picasso, etchings. They have um, at least one original Diego Rivera. And it's just in a little passageway that goes out the back door up to the guest house. Um, the, the stone was Pot, Pottsville sandstone. And one reference I read said it came from Pottsville, PA. But the quarry is on site. So I guess that's the name of the sandstone because it, the stone was quarried on site. And on property, when you get there to the visitor center, there's a little wheel looking at it, like a, a several little buildings. And there's a cafe, and there's a terrific gift shop, and they have a gallery. 
there's always some interesting exhibit at the gallery, not necessarily all in water related or Frank Lloyd Wright related. Um, and uh, the, the walks, like there's so many tours you can do there. You can just do a walking tour. Kids six, under six or six are not allowed in the house at all, but there are tours that you can take with them and you can have a guided tour of the, of the property. And Ray, Ray and I were going over this and he, he was asking me questions and he said, well, what time, what time of year is the best year to visit? And I said, every time of year is the best year to visit <laughs> because in the winter, we've been there in snow and it's beautiful. The spring is gorgeous. They're, they have rhododendron everywhere. And they have trillium, um, if, if, you can, if you know where to look and can find it. Um, so spring is wonderful, summer is great, fall, uh, fall is probably the best because of the leaves. The, the fall leaves are just gorgeous and that whole area is a beautiful area. And the last little tidbit that I found out about falling water, probably not the last, I still need to talk about the Kaufmans. During the 40s, they, they lived in Pittsburgh. They were very, very wealthy people who owned Kaufman's department stores, which were quite popular for a long time. And she had um, like a, a very high-end part of the store, you know, high-end designers. So they had wonderful taste and a lot of money, but they didn't go to the house all the time. And they had a caretaker who lived there. And at one time in the 40s, somehow it came to their attention that he was using it as a brothel. <laughs> because I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure they always called before they came, so that like the beds got changed and you know cleaned the house, and so it wasn't like they were just going to pop in. But apparently they did pop in at one point. But um, <laughs> see what you see. Yeah. so this is just a little too high. For me. So falling water was gifted to the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy in 1963, so 60 years ago, which is pretty impressive. And their son was an only child. He trained with Frank Lloyd Wright at Taliesin, which is how the Kaufmans came to meet him. And when um, they went to visit, they met Frank Lloyd Wright, became impressed with him, asked him to come to the site. He visited the site in 1934. A year later, Edgar Kaufman had heard nothing back from him. Um, he, had, he had contracted with him, probably gave him a deposit to do a design. So Kaufman was in Minneapolis and called and said, uh, you know, I'm not that far away. I'm going to come over. I want to see the designs for the house. So this would have been like 1935, I guess. <laughs> it's not like he could just fax them or, you know, send them. And uh, so Kaufman showed up. The legend is, and, and this happened, this is a legend in several houses, that Kaufman hadn't really put the pen to paper. But he did it in less than three hours with, of course, his apprentices at, at uh, Taliesin. And the house, the building began. And a lot of this information, I have some brochures at the end that we'll put out. Some of the information is in there. But originally, the estimate was twenty five to 35000 to build it. And um, Ray, I don't see it on here. $155,000. So one of the questions, you know, people would ask me, well, what would it cost to buy it now? It's like, well, it's not for sale. But I can tell you that in 2009, the this wonderful cantilevered balconies that are huge were failing. They were failing badly. And, and that had been a problem for a long time. It was $11 million to replace those. And let me go back. Uh, okay. I don't, I don't want to go too far back. There were 600 of those big stones, that, like this, the flooring in that main room. All 600 of those stones had to come out for the cantilever project. But $11 million, it took quite a while. It was in the news in Pittsburgh a lot. But um, Edgar and his wife died about three years apart. They had built a fabulous house that's quite famous in Palm Springs. And it was by the architect Neutra, who I'm not familiar with, but the house is very famous because there was a life or a look picture of two women sitting by the pool. So if you, I couldn't get a good picture of it, but they, they continued to um, enjoy the, you know, the benefits of their wealth. 
So Kentuck Knob is 15 minutes away from Falling Water. So if you go to one, you really need to plan to go to both. And I don't have a good picture of it, but the tree-lined road that goes up to Kentuck Knob must, I, I don't know what kind of trees they are, I couldn't find it, but they're red. So I'm assuming they're red maples. It's one of the prettiest sights I've ever seen. It's like the road is on fire. So I would say go to Kentuck Knob in the fall, but again, any time is good. Kentuck Knob is a much, you could imagine living in Kentuck Knob. It mu feels much more like a ranch home inside, very comfortable, still kind of low ceilings and small passageways, still just carports, you know, no garages. But the Hagens were an ice cream family. They, they're still Hagen ice cream. And um, they became, they bought property down there, bought 50 acres, became friends with the, with the Kaufmans and wanted um, to get the mm -hmm. architect's information. So they hired him. I think they kind of had the same story, you know, hired him and it was a year or two before the house was built. But um, they moved in on their 26th wedding anniversary in 1956. What a nice wedding anniversary gift. The estimated cost, again, was quite lower than what was the final. But in 1956, the estimate was 60000 and uh, the all-in was 96000 But that did include probably most of the furnishings. So uh, in the, what did we decide? In 89, I, yeah, Ray and I moved to Pittsburgh in 89. Lord Palumbo, um, who was like in the House of Commons in Great Britain, he is, was a real patron of architecture. And at one point he had contracted the very famous architect Mies van der Rohe to build a high rise in London. And he and Prince, uh, Lord Palumbo and Prince Charles had a major falling out over that. And the, the high rise never got built. But Lord Palumbo purchased the house and had an agreement to continue letting it be open for tours if he and his family were not in residence. And he is deceased now. So I it, I don't know, they may just be open for tours all the time. I don't know that his family comes over anymore, but I've been there two or three times. Ray's been there. And I just remember there were pictures on the, on the desk of Lord Palumbo and Princess Diana and other royals. It's a, they've kept it exactly like it would have been built, I'm sure. And um, they have a sculpture garden, which is very, very interesting. They are famous for these like red metal cutout figures. Um, it's called the Red Army. And it's really interesting. I just realized I do have slides. I thought we could skip around. So there's the entry. I, I love this house. I love the way the doors open out. Every little detail, the, the trim of the ceilings. There's the Red Army. Oh, well, the cute mine. little guy, not mine. This is just a photo I stole. And no, again, right. photos are not allowed, and <coughs> the children under six are not allowed. But interestingly, I did find photos on the internet. Uh, there are the carports. There's just some of the trim detail. And the, the Frank Lloyd Wright stone at the door. So in the sculpture garden, uh, Andy Gold. Goldsworthy is a really famous, my brother loves this guy. He builds walls and it's kind of an odd thing, but the last time I was in Kansas City, he had built a wall around the um, Nelson Art Museum and we, we went to see it and, and it's interesting. It's very interesting. Most of his exhibits are permanently built and there are two of them um, at Kentuck Knob. Dave was really nice about doing my slides, but I sent them to him in a weird, in a weird order. So it's my bad, not Dave's. But there is that beautiful tree-lined road. Um, so you can imagine those trees in full color. And there is a different Andy Goldsworthy. And um, another famous piece that's there is a Klaus Oldenburg apple. If you've seen the apple cores structures, sculptures, they're like this size. Um, they're kind of famous, like modern art which isn't my thing, but, and moving on to the next house, the next set of properties. So if you go to Western PA and you really like architecture and you like Frank Lloyd Wright, you should plan a couple of days because there's a third property called <laughs> Polymath Park. And Polymath, um, a Polymath <laughs> is a person of 
wide ranging knowledge. So that's why they named it. They basically named it after Frank Lloyd Wright because he was truly a polymath. So polymath, the first time I visited, they had three homes. <clears throat> and this is the Duncan house. And I met a man named Duncan this morning. And I said, I can remember your name because we're going to look at the Duncan house. <laughs> and there are not, I don't think I have any interior pictures of these homes because they're, pretty, they're so strict about it. But I just love the day I was there. There just happened to be a couple of Porsches in the driveway. Jonathan will appreciate that. Um, so this was a Usonian home that had been built in a suburb of Chicago. And, you know, it was being torn down for a suburb to be built. And the family, I don't know exactly how it happened, but the family sold it to somebody in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. It was taken apart piece by piece and put in three semi trucks and moved to Johnstown where it sat for a number of years because the person who bought it wanted to rebuild it as a community center, but just couldn't make the deal go through. So these people, these people who I guess own the land where Polymath Park is, purchased it. Um, they are now part of the Western PA Conservancy, I believe, but they had to rebuild the house. And the problem was the pieces had been numbered when they were taken apart, but then nobody knew what the numbers meant. <laughs> does A go with one or does A go with B? I, I took, it took them quite a while, but they did a lovely job. And you can see, I was there in the fall. It was quite lovely. So all of these, these next, these four houses you can stay in. And um, the tours, they have a variety of tours that include just one home. You can do two or three. And, you know, it's all on their websites. But the tours are $35 to $125. And, of course, the $125 is more of an in-depth. And I think it includes lunch at the restaurant that's kind of on-site. Um, and you can stay there. And I was telling someone, I was telling, uh, I think it was Dave, I've got a place for you to stay. It's only, it's 450 to 825 a night. <laughs> and you might have people coming in for a tour while you're staying there. <laughs> but you can bring three other people with you. So yeah. my friend and I at one time were considering when it was $600, we, we thought about it, but we didn't do it. Um, but it's just there, so there are two houses there that were moved and two houses that were built by a protege of Wright's who was from the Pittsburgh area. And his name is Peter Berenson. And this is one of the homes that was built by Peter Berenson. I, and I could not find a good picture of the other one. It just looked more like this. And I know they're quite dissimilar, but still just a lovely place in the winter they do um, sleigh rides around the property and you get to have hot cocoa and cookies in one of the houses and you know they're doing they're doing good things with their properties they're conserving them making them open to the public so this one I only have one slide up so this is Mantia and Mantia is another house that was rebuilt and do I have any information about that fairly recently, like in the 90s. And this is the one that I told you about. Oh, I, Lord, going back to Lord Palumbo, did I say that he bought that house in 1989 for $600,000? $600,000 in 1989. That really was not that much money in 1989 for a house that was in great shape, but he got a deal. He was, he was a real estate developer, so I suspect he was a great negotiator. But this is Mantia. It was moved from Minnesota. It had been owned the entire time by the same family. The grandson gifted it to this polymath park. And um, it was moved, but apparently, I'm sure they learned the lesson from the previous house and made sure the parts were identified correctly. So I've never seen that one because it's only been open a few years. But again, you can stay at any of these houses. Um, and Dave had found this slide. I don't think it's going to come up very clear, but it's just impressive to see how many Frank Lloyd Wright properties there are in just in our country. And he did build in Japan and maybe one other place, but I, there was so much information on him and, and I've heard a lot of different things through the years. And I definitely tried to pick and choose what I was going to talk about. But um, locally, there is a Frank Lloyd Wright 
library that has been reconstructed in the Allentown Museum. And it's open to the public at the museum. It's, I'm sure because it's a rebuilt room, it's, it's not an exhibit that goes away. Um, there's a place called Suntop that's on Sutton Road in kind of near Malvern. Sorry, I'm new to the area. And if I didn't write it down, I don't remember the name of the town. But um, it's not open to the public, but it, it must have been one of the first kind of townhouse design. It's a quadrant of four units, but they go up. So they're not like the floor plans are not, they're like a thousand square feet of floor, but then there are bedrooms and a deck and it is still, still in place. It hasn't been torn down, but it's not a museum. And of course the Guggenheim Museum in New York um, and the um, Beth Shalom Synagogue, which is in um, Elkins Park. And I've been there, my friend and I've been there. That's the last slide. Um, and I'm really interested in going again. And so I have a sign up sheet if anybody's interested, they do a nice tour. Last time I was there, I think it was $10. You know, I mean, they are a synagogue where they have worship services. So they're not really expecting to make much money off the tours, but they are kind enough to open it to the public. Um, and right now it looks like the tours are only on Sundays, but I, I did put a message, leave a message to see if, you know, if there was enough interest, if we could arrange a different day. Um, and I have some brochures about all the properties. Fall, I called Falling Water a couple months ago. They were so kind. Um, even though they're closed, they have staff there year round. And the woman put them in the mail to me that day and she sent brochures on every property. Not, she probably just didn't have a lot of polymath, so she didn't send me very many of those. But, um, <clears throat> Oh, oh, one more thing. If, if you're interested in Frank Lloyd Wright, and sorry for the people that are on Zoom, you're not gonna see this, but there is a book called The Architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright, a complete catalog. And it's written by William Allen Storer, S-T-O-R-R-E-R. -R -E -R. And I have the third edition, and there is now a fourth edition. In my mind, I thought, well, how much could things change? But things get torn down and obviously they get moved. So the Mantilla house that I just talked about is not in my book as being in um, like near Ohio pile, Chalk Hill. Um, but all those four, those six properties are within a half hour off of I-70 at the Seven Springs exit. Um, so it's a great long weekend. Um, somebody just said to me that they hadn't been to the 9-11 memorial. I'm afraid Ray and I are guilty of that, living that close, we never went. So there's lots to see over there. And then if you really wanted to venture, you could go into Pittsburgh. There's a little bit to see there. But um, I thank you all for coming out. I, I am done. Any questions? Anne? I just want to thank you for you taking my suggestion to have this. Oh, look at that. Synagogue. Mm -hmm. um, are you seriously interested if we, if we take a road trip that you could talk about it then with us? Um, yeah, I don't, I, I really don't know much about it. And there's, there's not like I, when I, I remember going and they didn't talk that much about it. When I was there, it definitely needed work. Um, you know, a lot of the wood needed to be refinished, stained, and I think upholstery needed to be replaced. Um, it is, you know, I think all of these properties are ongoing, like, like our own homes, they're ongoing and they get a little different kind of wear. So I could, but I just don't think there's that much information. I think, you know, we would try to get like a really good guide or docent. It would be a guided tour. Thank you. So, but yeah, I'm very interested in going back. It's, I think it's been eight years since I was there. So I'd like to see what it's like. Oh, and another house that's generally in the area that you can tour is the Pope Leahy house. And it's um, just outside of Alexandria. So it's, you know, an hour and a half or so away. I don't think we're going to do a field trip there. But it's a very, very small, very plain house. And I rem as I remember, the guy, the owner was a journalist. Um, and it wasn't a fabulous house. It wasn't an expensive house. Just, you know, kind of Frank Lloyd Wright did want his architecture to be available to anyone. So a lot of these people that built, like the houses that were moved, those were just suburban homes that probably weren't that much more than a normal home in their neighborhood, except maybe for that architect fee. So 
Any other questions? Yes. I was under the impression that when they were doing the renovation to raise the balconies, that when they took the stones off that were on the floor the balconies, <clears throat> they found they really couldn't raise them and they put the stones back down because they were afraid they're going to damage the structure. Uh, I, yeah, I don't think they raised anything. I think they just stabilized. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because it, it had dropped like a foot. Yeah, and I think it did that pretty, like in the first 10 years or so. I mean, he yeah. he was not a slave to those details. <laughs> he knew what he liked and he knew what looked good. And uh, I, every time I hear that story, I, if you go there for a tour, basically, you come away thinking you're just really fortunate that it didn't. I mean, they started failing pretty soon after it was well, built. The, the thing that's unique about that was when he designed it, he used rebar to hold up the concrete. Yeah. And the contractor said, no, no, that's mm -hmm. not enough. And they doubled the rebar that they put in there. And the end result was it still didn't hold up. Well, and when it was being built, Edgar Kaufman you know, was a pretty smart man, and he looked at the plans, and he knew it wasn't going to be stable enough, so he called in another engineer, and Wright just about walked off the job because of that, but they came to some kind of, you know, understanding, and, and it was stabilized better than it had been the first time, but yeah, I've been on those tours when you're out there with maybe 15 other people and looking around thinking, I, I think this might be over its weight limit. <laughs> Sherry, we have a question on from Larry and Nancy. Go ahead. Hi, Larry is back home. Um, there is a Frank Lloyd Wright designed house on the pro a property kind of adjacent to the Whitford Country Club. It is not open to the public. I don't believe it has been dismantled, but I remember when our girls were in high school, you could walk around the exterior property. You know, it's one of those little extra credit assignments. You could walk around the exterior of the property. So. I don't know if that's in any of the catalogs that you have, but um, at least it's reputed to be, and it certainly is in the same style. Walked around it probably 25 years ago. Um, so just throwing that out there as a local interest um, in, in this area, don't know the date, you know, don't know anything about the ownership, but you have seem to have a great wealth of knowledge about Frank Lloyd Wright's properties and where they've been constructed and where they've moved. So throwing that into the um, into the pot for future investigation. Nancy, um, I've only lived here six or eight months. What town would that be? Exton. Exton. You yes, there is definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like I know there's one. Um, either like Paoli or Exton. Exton it's, it's in the book. Exton Lionville. It's the north. And I didn't even mention it because the picture that I looked it up and the picture I saw looked like you couldn't see anything from the road. And I've done a few of those drive-bys myself. But yeah, I think it's in the book. I, I will look it up. And yeah, it's true. Add you, that. You, you can't see it from the road. It's kind of tucked away down a, a side road off of Richard Hills Road. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Uh, about 10 years ago, my uh, daughter, who lives in Pacifica, California, uh, decided with her husband to build a home in the Frank Lloyd Wright style of architecture. So they hired an architect who did a compilation of several homes of Frank Lloyd Wright throughout the United States. And I brought a book that I made oh, wow. of her home. And um, I did it on Shutterfly. We were just out there at, over the holiday for the first time to see it. She just moved into it. But it was a very, very difficult home to build. And they went through three different builders because the builders in California just were not familiar with or how to go about doing it with the ceilings that had the beams and all the built-in furniture and all of that. And it, um, it was a very difficult home to build. And uh, finally, after 10 years of working with the city and the architect and so forth and these three builders, the home came together. So it's very lovely. And it's, it's um, I made a book. Oh, I see it. Yeah. And, um, Anyway, um, 
you could see that she paid attention to the details of an arts and crafts and Frank Lloyd Wright uh, type of architecture. Thanks. Yeah, I definitely want to, want to see that when we're done. A couple questions, Dave. Is it true that uh, Wright design roofs have a leaky problem? I seem to have seen that on TV. That a lot of his houses yeah. have yeah. trouble <laughs> roof leaks because of his design. Yeah, definitely, definitely have problems. And and this falling water, um, I think I forgot to mention that when Kaufman finally saw the plans, did I say that he, they thought the house was going to be built at the point like where where Brad and Angelina were standing, where you see the view of the falls. And Wright was like, no, you're going to live over the falls where you hear the water all the time. But the house had major mold and mildew issues because of that. So yeah, as I said, he wasn't a slave to those little details. He just, you know, I think his first thing was, let's make sure it looks good. <laughs> so, um, it is. Oh, I forgot to make this announcement, but we will be circulating the recording of this presentation. And if you want to share it or review it again, just uh, and you're not on my email distribution list, just I have a paper back here that says, uh, please add me to the email list if anybody wants uh, to get a recording and forward it on to anybody else. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I appreciate everybody coming out. Some of my friends are here. And I, I appreciate the fact that I have friends at this church already. We haven't been here long, and we've been very happy, and we're looking forward to getting to know everybody. So thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.